Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to another SAO Capco um, webinar. I was going to say event, but we're, we're all webinar these days. Um, I'm Leah Oyman from Franklin Templeton representing the SAO networking team. And I am joined today by a great team of individuals from Capco that um, are going to take over and walk you through this webinar on design thinking in operations. So Amir is going to be um, walking you through pretty much all the slides and, and presenting this subject. Um, together with Sarah O'Callaghan, who has a lot of experience in working with different clients at Capco um, and using these um, approaches that Amir are going, is going to walk you through. Um, but we're going to um, kick off with Roland Inglis, who's going to be um, providing a quick background on himself and, and his team and his colleagues at Capco as well. Um, before we kick off, before I pass on to Roland, I just wanted to touch on a couple of housekeeping items. So um, we are all going to be muted throughout this presentation so that we have good quality of audio for everyone. However, we do want interaction and we do want you to post your questions on the Q&A button that hopefully you can see on your screens there. It's usually at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we would like you to use the chat functionality for um, one of the portions of the section which Amir will um, guide you through. Obviously, we're all part of different projects uh, in a lot of what we do through our organizations within the SIO, the member organizations at the SIO, a lot of them to do with regulatory requirements. But um, we all have to go through at some point a design thinking process. So hopefully this will be very helpful for all our SIO members and all the participants here. Without further ado, I'll pass you over to Roland. Thanks, Leah. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so um, thank you, um, all SIO members for attending, and uh, there's also some Capco clients on the uh, webinar this morning. So um, we're very proud of our association with SIO. It's really grown recently. This is the third of uh, session that we've done. We did in June, July, we did a session on new ways of working post-COVID. Um, and then in September there, we did a session around LIBOR and operations re operational resilience. And then obviously today, we've got Amir talking about the design thinking in operations. So hopefully keeping you guys uh, engaged in relevant current content um, and sharing some insights. Um, difficult to make these things that interactive just with the, the VC side, but obviously we'll have some time for Q&A. I don't want to spend much time talking about Capco. It's not a sales pitch, you know, it's not the time for that. But I'm a, I appreciate there will be some people that will know Capco very well and some people that will not know Capco at all. So by means of a sort of two minute overview and pricey, we're a management consultancy. We only work in financial services, 6,000 people globally, we're across 29 locations. Obviously, we've come from the capital market side of things, thus the name, the capital markets company. But very much now we have um, domains in wealth and asset management. It, we have an insurance practice, banking and payments. And then we've got deep solution um, areas. Um, we do a lot across business change and transformation, but you know, digital, our digital practice and our data practice are accounting for an awful lot of our business now. Um, in fact, almost everything we do has got a digital or data flavor. Also our technology practice, you know, deep engineering, regulatory is key for us, and then sort of FRC, finance risk and compliance. So, um, We've got about 1,100 people in London, and as this slide shows you, we've really grown over the last four and a bit years in Scotland, up to 140 people at the start of the year, and we've even seen some growth this year in a COVID year, and uh, we continue to grow, um, which is obviously very positive and uh, cautiously optimistic about the future as well. So um, without further ado, I, I think everybody's here to hear about design thinking, so I will um, hand over to Amir to get into the content for today, but if there's any questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to any of us um, from Capco. Amir. Thanks, Roland. Hopefully you can all hear me fine. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Amir. I'm a principal design consultant in Capco. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about design thinking and operations, which is a combination of words you don't really see that often. I think if you Google it, it's pretty much just my kind of papers and LinkedIn updates that show up. So hopefully uh, by the end of kind of this session, you'll have a good understanding of what is design thinking as, a, as an innovation framework and how it can be applied to solve problems in operations. 
just a bit about myself and sort of my journey so you know how I'm approaching this fascinating topic. I began my career about 20 years ago in the dot-com days as a web designer, got into web development, was in academia doing research for about nine years. 11 years ago, I got into front office trading platform design, so doing a lot of user experience, designing a lot of complex information for traders, sales traders. Uh, I joined Capco four years ago, where basically I'm applying the same very human-centered creative design process, but rather than just applying it to design a dashboard or a trading platform, I'm coaching and working with internal teams within operations primarily to solve problems by adopting a new mindset, a new framework, and new tools. And it's been really fascinating for me as a designer to see how people that may not see themselves as creatives or people that, you know, the work might be uh, business analysis or subject matter experts in operations with the right environment and the right setup, they can be very creative. They can come up with ideas that otherwise they wouldn't necessarily consider. And this is what I want to talk to you today is what is design thinking and how it applies to operations. This is very much in the context of innovation as we're going to see. But before we're going to do that, just a, a virtual show of hands. Uh, you're going to see a poll popping up hopefully any second now. And just to get a sense from everyone on this webinar, um, how familiar are you with design thinking as an innovation process? Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar at all? Um, I know that some people may have attended some training. Um, I know that some people may have read some materials that are online. But I guess in the context of operations, I often hear from people, I did the training. It was all very retail. It's all about customers buying stuff on Amazon. How does that apply to my work in enterprise applications and operations? So hopefully, OK, so we got the results back. Great. I think it's a nice, uh, nice spread between kind of uh, people that are new to the topic and people that are more familiar with it. Um, as we said at the beginning, if you have any questions, please just put them in the Q&A. Um, we will take them towards the end. So the first thing I want to talk about before we dive into design thinking as a framework is, is innovation, because fundamentally, if you look at any business, irrespective of industry, Every business always has to innovate, whether it's because of new regulation, global pandemic. If you ask any business manager, they'll say, you know, we have to innovate. We have to tackle problems creatively. I want our people to be able to come up with novel, disruptive, ingenious ideas. Um, and that's really the goal uh, in many, many cases. But if you actually look at what makes a solution, not just new, novel, blue sky, sort of crazy idea, what actually makes it truly successful and innovative you really have to kind of look at these sort of three components and that's kind of basic innovation 101. Um, for a solution to really be successful and kind of have the impact, typically you're looking at achieving three things. First of all, it has to solve a problem or an issue that people have. Um, those people can be an internal staff, can be your counterparties, your clients, your managers. It has to solve a problem because if it doesn't, people will look at it, pick it up and say, mm, I don't get it. How is that going to make a difference in my life or in my work? And there's a lot of examples of applications and operations that get rolled out and either they're not fit for purpose because people don't know how to use them, it doesn't fit in their kind of world, or they don't actually see the need for it. But you also have to make sure that your idea is technologically feasible. You can come up with ideas that people would love and say, when can I start using it? but the technology is not there yet. It's very blue sky. It will take a long time to make it available for people. And the third thing is, is about you know, the business case. You can have an idea that you can build. You can have an idea that you can build and people would love, but it's gonna take a lot, a lot of money and you're gonna lose money in the process. So that's not good. I wanna be clear that when we talk about innovation in this context, this is not just some greenfield, blue sky ideas that end up in a colorful PDF that no one would ever implement, I would never build. This is about coming up with ideas that are truly innovative. And in order to do that, it's about hitting that innovation sweet spot. Now, what I've observed in kind of my many years working with sort of clients and operations and front office and so on, is that as you can imagine, when we talk about innovation in those environments, there's a very, very strong focus on technology, especially in operations. You know, talk about innovation straight away, RPA, chatbots, blockchain, AI. The reality is that giving this talk about design thinking and human-centered innovation is always a bit of a challenge because in operations, in many cases, innovation is about removing the dependency on people. 
because in some cases people do costly, low value, mundane tasks that add to our operational risk, add to our cost. And what I want to show you today is that in many cases, people are still very relevant in operations. Uh, even once you automate and get rid of a lot of the low sort of low value mundane tasks that you probably outsourced already to some offshore location, people are still going to be around, maybe doing more high value things. Uh, and you also have people on the other side, you know, operations and counterparties, uh, regulators, suppliers and vendors and so on. I think that despite the, the perception that focusing on people and adopting a very human-centered approach to innovation operations is not as relevant, it's actually very relevant. First of all, uh, if you don't really look at kind of the people component carefully and you just focus on let's roll out a new technology, a new Salesforce, a new kind of third-party tool, uh, there's a, a, a potential risk of introducing operational risk to the process because people might uh, make mistakes, you know, they might uh, be confronted with systems and processes they don't really understand or are familiar with because they weren't designed with those people in mind and with the nuances of operational work there's a lot of nuances there's a lot of differences in how you would engage certain counterparties from others and this is something that we really have to understand you're also taking the risk of reducing productivity if you end up rolling rolling out solutions that don't, don't really fit the way that your clients and your operations teams work and i've seen that a lot uh, the reality is that a lot of solutions in operations, in my experience, they get rolled out by technology. Uh, they may have done some kind of user interviews at some points uh, in the past, but there really isn't that much focus as you would expect or as you see maybe more um, customer facing applications. But when we're talking about operations, I think there's a lot, a lot of need for that. And the other thing is reputational risk. You know, if you're uh, rolling out solutions or if you have suboptimal uh, solutions for your clients, for example, uh, self-serve reporting tools and so on, that can definitely cause a reputational risk as well. So companies and operations are not different. It's all about how can we be more innovative? You know, we wanna, we wanna come up with more disruptive ideas. We want our people to not just do the standard stuff. Um, I had an MD in one of the biggest uh, tier one banks saying, I asked my team to innovate this process and all they can come up with, we can add another column to the spreadsheet. Think about that, right? There's a lot of legacy, there's a lot of dependency on those sort of systems and how do you get people to start going beyond that? If you look at innovation literature, uh, there are sort of four themes that have been identified across innovative companies. And those are companies not just uh, launching services and products, but even in healthcare, in travel, uh, financial services. And essentially, if you want to have an innovative organization and innovation culture, the first thing is about fostering cross-functional collaboration. You know, it's not a technology project. It's not about the BAs running around for six months with PowerPoint and BRDs and Visio diagrams. It's a cross-functional collaboration because that's how you get all those different ideas. That's how you get diverse thinking rather than groupthink. Um, and in my experience working with investment banks, primarily uh, change programs and transformation can be very siloed. Uh, you might get the occasional kind of a meeting that 40 people get invited to, 39 go on mute, and the BA just goes next, next on the PowerPoint for that uh, presentation. Uh, that's not how you get innovation. Uh, you definitely need much more cross-functional collaboration. The second component that companies that innovate well are very good at is really understanding people's needs and problems. And people can be customers, can be your internal staff, can be your managers, can be your HR, Whoever you're trying to solve for, uh, those are companies that understand the value of doing proper user or customer research. And as I'm gonna show you, this is not just going to people with a clipboard and saying, what do you want? Tell me how to fix this thing for you. It's about stepping back, really learning and understanding people's experiences and figuring out where you can start making a difference and what are the opportunities to innovate? Because people are so used to doing things in a certain way, I mean, people that have been in doing the same process for 20 years, I don't necessarily expect them to come up with an ingenious solution of how to fix things. Uh, the third element of innovative companies is creative thinking. How do you instill kind of this open-mindedness and, and the, the environment where people in your organization feel free to express their ideas, even if those ideas are wild and crazy, go against the norm, uh, completely challenging the status quo, how do you have meetings where people kind of raise their hands and saying, how can we don't do this? 
what happens if we don't send the clients the paper-based reports? Does the regulator really say that we have to do this? Has anyone ever checked? And, and that's a culture thing. And in many environments, people don't feel the, I would say, kind of the, the freedom to be able to express themselves that way. And the fourth thing that a lot of innovative companies do very well, when they have an idea, they go out and prototype it very quickly. And prototyping is not about spending six months coding something and having a UAT that some people can tell you, you know, it's not working for me. It's about pen and paper. It's about, as I'm going to show you, whiteboard sketches, anything to bring an idea to life when the risk is low, the cost is low, and you can start gaining feedback. And you might realize, you know what, it's not gonna work. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Or it's gonna work with a bit of tweaking. And this is really what design thinking is all about. You've got those four components that help to spark innovation within organizations. And design thinking, it's a, a people-centered innovation framework. We're gonna see that it puts people in the center and it provides organizations and operations, in this case, a logical and a creative innovation process. So as I'm gonna show you, you know, we've got a very logical process that follows a number of steps. There's a certain mindset that uh, you have to apply. This is not just about having a playbook and a PDF with some templates to populate as part of your existing transformation processes. Some things you can maybe inject, but this is the mindset and the tools. Design thinking is nothing new. I mean, designers like myself have been applying design thinking from the very beginning. If you go to any design studio uh, in the last maybe even sort of 40 years and probably before that, this is the way designers work. If you need to design a new product, whether it's a digital or a physical product like a phone or a television or a website, as a designer, this is a process you follow. You know, you start with people understanding what they do. You try and hone in on, on, on specific problems you identify. And then you become very creative and try to come up with a lot of ideas before you then pick the ones you think have a chance and you prototype those very quickly. And the interesting thing with design thinking is that um, a while ago, companies started to realize, you know what? You know that really kind of innovative process that designers do? Maybe we can use it in our business, even if we're not designing applications and websites and tools and so on. And design thinking is almost a way of, if you like, exporting the design mindset, the design toolkit, the design process into business. And now you have design thinking being taught in, in all the business schools. You've got companies across many industries trying to adopt design thinking as a way of coming up with better solutions that address the problems that their internal staff have, that their customers have, and really looking at ways of sparking creativity and innovation internally. The process itself, if you look at it, and I'm gonna show you some example in a minute, um, there's two parts to it. The first one, and this is what we call the double diamond model, is step back, don't make assumptions, you know, don't, don't kind of let your bias creep in. Uh, find the right problem, talk to people. This is where we apply what we call divergent thinking. You keep an open mind, you wanna be curious. You, know, you don't wanna have people coming in and saying, oh, they need a dashboard that's gonna figure, this is gonna solve the problem they have, or they need a new uh, workflow tool, or they need a new reporting tool, or they need a plugin for Outlook. If you come with that mindset to solve a problem in operations, it's a very narrow way of looking at it, and you're probably gonna come up with the same old solution that probably isn't working. Design thinking is about starting the process by listening, by getting to know your end users, um, this is not necessarily your typical BA current state. It's not about the Visio. It's not about trying to map out the current state with every button press, decision point. I'm going to show you some examples. When you go and listen and you hear about people's day, you hear about their experiences, you hear about what works, what doesn't work, you then distill it into very concrete problems and insights that you've uncovered. And that's the second stage. You might spend, in, in my case, the project that I run, we would spend maybe a week or two talking to, whether it's the operations teams, the managers, the counterparties, you gather a lot of information, you take photos, you, you, you doodle little kind of quotes and sound bites you get from people, but then you have to take a step back and really start applying what we call convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is about open-mindedness, be taking everything in, uh, being very curious, but then you have to start analyzing. Okay, what have we learned? So we heard a lot of stuff about uh, breaks. We heard a lot of stuff about clients querying about this and that. We heard a lot of stuff about people working late hours and high attrition and managers not having enough time to supervise. Okay, so you start picking up some of those themes and you pick the ones that you think will have the highest impact. And then you go into the second diamond, which is all about solutionizing. 
And what I found working with a lot of teams in operations is that people's knee jerk reaction is to skip to the second diamond. You know, you, you have a conversation and they're saying, okay, we know what the problem is, let's just come up with ideas. And when you ask them, how do you know that's the problem, right? Um, you realize that then there's a bit of a blank expression on people's faces. So design thinking allows us to make sure that we're finding the right problem and it's validated and it links back to people's stories, people's experiences. And ideation is again, where we diverge. You apply divergent thinking again, in order to come up with every possible idea. This is really creative thinking because even if a colleague might have a really crazy idea, you want to listen because even if you're not going to implement it, but it's going to make you think about something you didn't think about before. And it's, whatever you're going to say next is going to trigger something in another colleague. And how you apply divergent thinking is very important and it's crucial for design thinking. If you just sit in a room and everyone thinks, oh, we'll never get the funding. Oh, the regulator is not going to allow us to do this. Oh, compliance this and legal that. You're not going to innovate. You're going to have too many constraints already baked into your process. Uh, design thinking is about stepping back temporarily, temporarily, that's the key thing, in order to generate a lot of ideas that you then start to analyze. And this is where you converge your thinking again. The last step is where you apply those constraints. We start thinking, okay, maybe we cannot get rid of all the paper-based reporting for our clients, but maybe just some of them. Maybe we cannot uh, get rid of this system completely, but we can start only using certain functionality of it. Design thinking for me is about having that mindset. It's about um, that creativity, that's, that, that sort of playfulness, that curiosity about why can't we do this? And maybe we do that. And the last step is you pick your ideas that you think are actually kind of have potential and you prototype them when the, when the cost and the risk is, are very low in order to test and see what the, the reaction is. You might think you might have a great idea, but when you take it back to your end users in operations, they might shrug and saying, ah, not really gonna sort of make that much difference to my life because I use Outlook for this or I use this spreadsheet for that or my colleague just tells me what are the kind of the high priorities for the day and so on. And, and that's okay. Uh, one of the mantras in design thinking is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. If the solution doesn't work and you early on pick that up, that's fine, you can just move on. Just uh, before I show you some examples of, of work I've done in operations applying design thinking, uh, just to summarize some of the benefits very quickly, when you adopt design thinking in, in operations, in my experience, first of all, you improve, you improve creative thinking. You allow your BAs, your uh, uh, people from the line, your change, uh, transformation people, anyone who's involved in that process, because I'm gonna talk about the cross-functional, the co-creation. You wanna put a, a, a team to solve a problem. Straight away, you allow them to be more creative. You improve that team's focus on the end users because the whole methodology and the whole framework is based on people. You start by identifying who do we need to talk to? Who do we need to get to know? Who do we need to empathize with? And really get a sense of what they go through. And even if your challenge is in sort of risk, controls, whatever, you have to reframe the problems. You have to humanize them. And that's really where that focus comes in. Um, I found that it really helps reduce the time to define and validate concepts. A design thinking project, uh, in my view, is, is, is quite sort of short and sharp. It's a creative burst and you have to keep that momentum. I think typically I found that sort of eight to nine weeks is a good time to facilitate that process with a team uh, that allows them to do the research, to define the problems, to come up with ideas, to prototype some ideas and quickly test them. Um, it also increases employee engagement. When you start assembling these solution teams to solve problems by applying design thinking, you allow people, whether they're doing BAU or sort of uh, CTB work, to become involved in very strategic, very creative, very interesting piece of work. And it really increases employee engagement in that sense. Uh, you also reduce delivery risk because in a matter of weeks, you're gonna have your proof of concept as some sketches, some user journeys, maybe some wireframes, uh, and you can clearly see if it's gonna work or not conceptually. I mean, design thinking is about coming up with a concept that's validated, that everyone has a sense of ownership over. Um, and the last thing is by creating those solution teams, by bringing together people from technology, from operations, from change, legal compliance, whoever has to be part of that solution team, and that will usually be up to maybe 10 to 12 people. You have to keep it quite manageable. Like I said, this is not sending an invite to 40 people and CCing half of the organization. You really start breaking down those barriers between the silos. Uh, and it's been really satisfying for me to see how when you, when you really create those, those teams, 
people from operations start having much better conversations with technology, both upstream and downstream, and it has a lot, a lot of benefits. To put this in context of operations, because I think there's, there's, there's great potential and there's a lot of interesting places in, in operations where you can apply design thinking to drive innovation. When I talk about starting with people and learn about their experiences, so that first diamond, you know, that divergent thinking, there are so many people in operations still. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, even with all the recent automations and kind of uh, advances, there are still people. And for me, you know, operations, it's everyone. It's, you know, your collateral analyst that spends hours trying to find emails in an overflowing inbox. I mean, I've seen operations analysts that have maybe almost a thousand folders and subfolders in Outlook. And that's how they manually and some rules and whatnot, they have to find emails from a client query six months ago. And that can take a long, long time. I'm talking about the settlements team lead that's always sort of firefighting every day, you know, using legacy systems from the 80s and 70s, a very complex product set that even the, the, their own team don't always understand because of high attrition. They always have to keep hiring and retraining and reskilling. And it could even go to the very top. I mean, I spoke to global function heads, you know, MDs that told me how they start their day on the train back in the day, uh, six in the morning, reading all the emails that came overnight from Asia about system outages, trying to get a sense of, okay, so what's going to happen today? How is this going to impact my business globally? And that's where you start building that empathy. That's where you start realizing, okay, this is what their life is all about. How can I start improving it? When you then come up with many, many ideas, you really want people to feel that there's a safe environment where they can voice ideas and they're not going to be shut down in flames. Design thinking mindset is having the team working in an environment where no one is going to look at, I don't know, Sally and saying, what have you been smoking? We can never do this. We can never tell the counterparty that we can't send them the spreadsheet or there's no way we can consolidate 10 reports into one and keep it, keeping it cost effective. If you've got those people in the room, then you want to kick them out, right? Or you want to tell them very politely to stop doing that. Because if you want to innovate and if you want to become design led, if you want to have your teams coming up with more ingenious, creative ideas, you need to weed out that kind of behavior. It's not, it's not helping. People sometimes think they're being very smart by picking up all the constraints and all the holes, but for innovation, it's not gonna help. Um, and you want people to say, hey, what, no, we could prevent front office from taking an action until this is resolved. Um, I worked with a, an operations team that had to deal with a lot of exceptions that came overnight when someone in front office pushed some changes on a trade and, and, and they were trying to focus on handling those exceptions. And then someone said, hold on, maybe we can even start you know, addressing the root cause. Maybe front office should be um, notified that whatever they're gonna do now is gonna have this huge impact on operations. Or maybe when they do it, we get a notification straight away so we can start planning for the next day. Someone might say, you know what, we could go to clients and advise their operations team on how to improve. So rather than just looking at operations as we just have to handle all the breaks and exceptions and do all this manual work, Maybe we can go to the source and maybe we can become more advisory and help our clients be more efficient so we don't have to then have all the operational costs attached to it. Um, we could update performance management to reflect this as a priority. I mean, what you can see here is that you want people to really be creative, to really come up with a lot of ideas. And then what you do, you use sketches, user journeys, and other means I'm going to show you to say, okay, bring your idea to life, let's, let, let's test it, let's see. Maybe it's gonna be the best thing ever, or maybe it's not gonna work because people are not gonna respond well to it and that's fine, you know, you don't have to be, don't get too attached to ideas. It's just an idea, it's probably something you just wrote down in 30 seconds. It's not necessarily something you should get too carried away with. What I wanna do for the, the rest of the, the session is just to share with you some examples from work that I've done in operations when I was facilitating teams. So the way that I, I would typically work, um, there would be a certain sort of challenge and we would decide to apply design thinking. And that's usually where, uh, you know, the kind of the stakeholder, the, the MD would say, we need fresh ideas. We need to make sure we get down to the bottom of this. We need to make sure that we don't just come up with the same old. Uh, design thinking methodology, in my experience, is, is highly relevant for problems that are open-ended. If you go to this and you say, oh, they need a dashboard, or oh, they just need this and that, you're already kind of in solution mode. You probably just need to spec it, design it, wireframe it, UX it, and that's fine. You're probably gonna use very similar tooling. But design thinking for me, you really benefit when it's more strategic, when it's more open-ended. 
And when you realize or accept that you're gonna frame the problem from the point of view of people. Again, if you go back to one of the earlier slides, design thinking is a human-centered, people-centered framework. If your problem is purely technical and you're just looking at migrating some systems or establishing some connectivity, or if you're just looking at reducing some controls in your sort of risk framework and, and you can't really humanize it and saying, let's approach this from the point of view of people, then maybe you should just approach it in a different way, not design thinking. It's not a silver bullet. There's other kind of change methodologies uh, you, you can apply. So when you start with people, you conduct field studies and you talk to people. This was from a project I worked on where we looked at um, operational risk and supervision. So the client basically said, look, we're experiencing far more operational risk incidents that are linked to supervision than we would like. And you know, we want to solve this. We want to kind of understand what's going on. Initially, the client did just kind of have a view of let's give all the supervisors a risk dashboard. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Right. The reality is that most of those people probably already have 10 dashboards that they don't even use. So you talk to people and you start picking up some of their issues. One of them will tell you, uh, actually, my problem is that I need to build complex knowledge within my team so I can spend less time solving their issues and more time supervising. You know, it's not about the dashboard. I just don't have time because I'm constantly firefighting. Um, his line manager might say, you know, help me be proactive and ask line supervisors the right questions. So I'm, I know that I'm on top of things and, and I feel sort of less anxious about my day. Um, and as you can see, this is about identifying the needs. No one's gonna say, help me get a dashboard, help me get a workflow tool, help me do this. This is where you need to be quite kind of switched on and be able to understand that this is not about asking people what they want. And I think people sometimes make the mistake and they're thinking that focusing on people and kind of empathy building is asking people what they want. This is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Henry Ford. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? Think about it. Your end users, they don't know what technology can do. They're not as creative necessarily as you. You don't just shortcut innovation by going to your customers or your end users in operation and tell me, so what's the solution? They might have good ideas and you can definitely take those on board, but a lot of times they'll just tell you faster horses. When I do my empathy building and user research, you know, you have to be inquisitive, you have to be observant. Um, who does the operations analyst interact with and how? And I just sketch this, you know, this is not a template. This is not specifically something that came out of a playbook. This is just how myself and the team started building an understanding of who does that person interact with and what does that tell us? We then looked at how does the team cover the different counterparties? And we were quite surprised, if not shocked, to realize that they were dividing it alphabetically which definitely raised a lot of questions. When I go to these engagements with a design kind of led approach, you talk to people and you take photos. If someone tells you, an operations manager told me that they're really busy, and I, I asked how busy, right? Because you wanna be a bit nosy, you wanna be a bit you know, curious in a good way. And I asked to get a photo of their um, um, calendar. And this is something that stuck with us because all the ideas we thought, how would that fit within their busy day? Um, I saw analysts still using physical calculators straight away. Can I take a photo of that? You know, what is the issue with this? What is the kind of productivity issues, operational risk issues, and so on? Someone told me that they, you know, they can check some uh, documentation on the train on their phone, but they can't actually attest on the phone that they read it. So they have to spend half hour every morning in the office to actually go through the same process and just attest. So being design led, as I said, it's not about the Visio, it's not about the PowerPoint, it's not about the spreadsheets, for me anyway. It's about bringing that design mentality that's much more, um, I would say visual, that's much more about curiosity and, and understanding. And once you build a view of the problems, you go into ideation mode. And this is really kind of the part I think everyone always enjoys. This is about divergent thinking. We use various techniques and we're gonna play with one uh, in a minute to really get the team that cross-functional pod, if you like, once you give them the challenge of saying, okay, how can we build knowledge in the team so the supervisor has more time to supervise? And one of the techniques we use is called crazy eights. And everyone in the team has eight minutes to come up with eight different ideas to solve the problem. So someone has a stopwatch and you got like 60 seconds, your first idea, and then, 60 seconds, idea number two, you can write it down, you can 
doodle it, you can illustrate it, as you can see from those examples. But this is how you ask people to relax constraints and just put everything on the table. And you can see an example from some of those projects. And it's really fascinating to see what people come up with. You know, someone said, you know, black holes, you know, when, when, when it's gone quiet on a particular metric, bring it to the supervisor's attention. Or something called the QSIP clinic. I think it has a nice ring to it. Uh, team members share knowledge on a weekly basis and their experiences with maybe um, challenging counterparties or products and so on. You really want to get your cross-functional team to come up with a lot, a lot of ideas that you then start to analyze by applying convergent thinking and think, okay, but out of all those ideas, which ones are desirable, feasible, viable? And what's gonna be the roadmap that will take us there? Because it's okay to come up with an idea that's quite bold and ambitious and disruptive, because you're gonna to have to figure out what's gonna be the roadmap to take you there. These days, we do a lot of those sessions online. So you've got tools like Envision, and you've got tools like uh, uh, Mural and Miro and all that, that really allow team, even if they work sort of uh, remotely, to take part in a lot of these design thinking activities, like, for example, a Crazy 8 session. What I'd like to do now is just a, a very short activity. I've been talking for a while. Um, when we want to get our cross-functional teams to get relaxed and kind of more comfortable with voicing ideas, one of the activities we use is called the worst possible idea. You, you, you basically ask people to voice the most ridiculous, outrageous idea possible, and then you work back and start to kind of think, ooh, this is interesting. Maybe there's something here we can do. What I'm going to ask you is to use the chat function in Zoom and come up with your worst possible idea or ideas. If you've got crazy ideas, that's great. Um, what's the worst possible way we could encourage people to walk and cycle more? Okay, if there were no constraints, everything goes. Uh, write down ideas as far-fetched and silly, if you like to think about it, as, you know what, let's just take everyone's cars. One day we we'll just show up and just remove all the cars from the streets. Let's close all the petrol stations. If people can't, you know, sort of get petrol, they won't drive. Uh, let's make driving on weekends illegal, or let's pay people to walk or cycle instead of driving. So I'm going to be quiet for one minute, and I'd love to see a bunch of other very kind of worst possible ideas that everyone can come up with. So let's just take a minute and let's see what you got. Okay, someone said you can add spikes to roads, make the traffic lights really bad so journeys take longer. Love that raising road tax, putting 100 kilograms sort of weights on people's bikes, okay. Make more streets pedestrian, driving license only for the age of five to 10 year olds, great. I love that, giving people puppies so they'd be forced to walk, give everyone a boy's bike. Excellent. Now, if you start thinking about the problems you face in operations, and what I found is to really get people into that creativity mindset, even such sort of simple activity starts taking your team in directions that they wouldn't otherwise thought about. So it's not just about the spreadsheet. It's not just about Outlook and using another Salesforce tool. You want people to drive innovation by really focusing on other aspects and other areas as well. Uh, the last few things I'm just going to share with you. Um, so you spoke to people, you've understood their experiences, you uh, apply divergent thinking to come up with a lot of ideas, but now you need to converge again. And there's a number of techniques we use to bring ideas to life because you have an idea, great, but you need to bring it to life for two reasons. One, so you can start seeing it and keep tweaking it as a team. But the other one is that you can start testing it and showing it to your end users and, and, and get the feedback. Uh, we use techniques like user journeys that you can see on, on the left. And that's really for that more end-to-end -end holistic story of saying, okay, how this idea is gonna work. And you can see, we actually tell it from the point of view of the personas, the people that we're trying to solve for. What's gonna be their future experience? And you might realize that you need to tweak some things about it. Uh, if it's a tool, you can use pen and paper to start sketching out some of the data points, some of the functionality. What are the KPIs, KRIs that you have in mind? And those are things that you allow people to then provide feedback on. Um, this is a slightly blurry image, but just to show you an example from a co-creation prototyping workshop I, I ran. So with the whole team, we created all these kind of quite, quite big uh, scenarios where we pick different business scenarios like end of month uh, incident or something like that. 
and the whole team started building out with the ideas we prioritized, what would that look like? And they started to realize that some things they thought would work probably wouldn't work. Some things they missed the first time could work. Uh, prototypes are meant to be very kind of rough, low cost, low risk. We use paper prototypes as well. So if you want to test an idea you have for a new tooling or an enhancement for a tool, you can use even techniques like this. It takes only a few hours to print out or sketch out what your future user journeys might look like. And that's what you give people to play with and you get the feedback and how would you identify the trade from this thing? Uh, where would you go to identify the counterparty? Where would you go to see the audit trail on this investigation? And you learn so much, even from something so rudimentary and basic, you get a lot of very good feedback that allows you to very quickly iterate. The last thing I'm gonna talk about before we go into q and I spoke about design thinking as a methodology and a mindset to spark innovation within operations. The reality is that design thinking is not just about the toolkits. I mean, I showed you user journeys and personas and crazy eights and worst possible ideas, but all those things are tools, you know, they're activities and outputs, as you can see on the right. But in order to really make good use of them, you need to make sure you've got the right culture in place, right? And the right values, the right behavior and the right mindset. Uh, you know, there are no bad ideas. It's a safe to try environment. We want people to be curious, not apathetic about things. We want to encourage co-creation rather than politics and siloed. And in order to create that culture, you need the business commitment all the way from the top, right? So it is a journey. You can't just expect to land on your kind of teams and BAs, some design thinking playbooks, and off you go, be creative, be human centered, be innovative. That's not gonna work. You definitely need to take a much broader perspective and think about what is the culture that we want to cultivate? What is the innovation culture we want to see? And then what are the tools that we're gonna use for that? So I know it was a lot um, to take in. Hopefully you found it interesting. I'm gonna switch over to uh, Sarah now to go through some of the questions that we're both gonna take. And I'll be quiet for a second. <laughs> Thanks, Amir. Hi everyone, Sarah O'Callaghan here. Um, some of you may remember me from the last two webinars that we run, um, and I work very closely with Leah and Ray at the SIO um, to pull these together. Um, so, Amir, thank you for that. Hopefully for the audience it was um, very interesting. I think a lot of people generally have heard of design thinking, and um, I do hear a lot of people saying, you know, I understand the theory, but how does that really work in practice and I think that especially the last half of, of your presentation Amir um, was really relatable and hopefully helped bring design thinking as a concept to life and uh, demonstrate how we do use it um, with our clients. So hopefully that was useful, educational, and for me, definitely very interesting. I liked some of the, some of the ideas we had in worst possible mm -hmm. idea. I think one of them said, um, make the inside of cars smelly, <laughs> which was an interesting one. Love it, love it. Um, okay, so we've had quite a few questions come through. Um, the first one I'm gonna pick up on is, hi Amir, how do you decide if design thinking is the right approach to solve a problem? Cool, uh, I get asked that a lot. Um, as I mentioned, design thinking is a human-centered methodology. So if you wanna solve a problem, first of all, you have to agree or kind of think that it makes sense to frame the problem from the point of view of people and think about, okay, who are the people that we're gonna focus on and what's the experience that we want to solve for? Uh, in some cases, it's a very obvious one. So if it's a counterparty, you might think, okay, it's the operations team working in the counterparty or so on. If it's purely technological, and as I said, it's, it's really something that some solution architects and some BAs can work on, maybe design thinking is, is not the right toolkit to try and solve it. And the second sort of criteria is, is it open-ended? It has to be an open-ended challenge that doesn't prescribe a solution, ideally, because the whole point and the power of this framework is exploring like we did with the worst possible idea, different ways of solving a problem. So make sure it's human-centered and make sure that it doesn't prescribe a solution. That's my, my advice. 
Great, thanks. Um, another one that's come here, and again, something that's very relevant um, that I can probably take this one, Amir, is are there any specific tools such as software that you need to support a design thinking project? I would say you don't need tools in order to do a design thinking project. It's possible to run them, you know, with the traditional day-to-day -to -day tools. You'll have seen from some of the examples that Amir um, showed you that they do tend to be quite in uh, collaborative. Um, ideally, we would all be in a room together um, running design thinking workshops where we can ideate together as a group using post it notes, etc. Obviously, within the last six months, um, it hasn't been as easy um, with the global pandemic. So, a tool that we have found really, really useful is Mural. There are many other online collaborative tools, but Mural is um, an online collaboration tool that makes collaboration easy. You can work with your team in a dynamic and virtual environment. Um, and as I said, it's become even more relevant recently. Um, I mean, it's not also just about that online collaboration tool. In recent times as well, it's very important that you think about how you structure your sessions. Um, you know, people are virtual now, so how do we structure a session in a way that keeps things interesting and interactive? Maybe you have shorter um, time slots, maybe you have more breaks, maybe something that would have been a, a one day immersive session may now be run over two days. On a sh with a shorter period of time. Um, and I then think finally, thinking about the, the tools or software that you already use, the likes of T Microsoft Teams or Zoom or WebEx, depending on what you use in your organization. Um, understanding the functionality that you can use within. It's not necessarily just a VC um, or messaging conferencing tool. Um, a lot of them have breakout functionality, which really help with the design thinking type approaches. Um, Mural also, you know, allows to do interactive sessions with up to, I think you can do more than 100 people, or you can virtually stick post-it notes on walls. So it definitely is still possible during the pandemic, I would say. So just to build on that slightly, it's maybe worth saying, I mean, you know, we in the past have run sort of design thinking sessions just, you know, with some of our clients where they've got problem statements and we take it into our design labs and, you know, we do, you know, without adhering a cost to it, you know, whether it be a half day or a full day, be it in our, you know, London office or our Edinburgh office and actually that's the best way to see because it is a cultural mindset in terms of how you do these things. So there isn't a massive cost to it. But like you say, we can do that as well for clients with the mural tooling, you know, and, and demonstrate that. So if people are interested of like, how does it work? How does it run? Then, you know, we're happy to sort of invest with clients on a, you know, looking on how you could do that if you have a specific problem statement. Yeah. Thanks Roland. One thing actually you mentioned there is, you know, what I've noticed over the last few months running um, different projects um, with different clients is the fact that we are all working virtually now means from a design thinking or a collaboration ideation and workshop perspective, historically we would have done them in one location and people would need to fly in. Um, or you know we could it would even need to be on a global scale now you can actually do that a lot easier virtually and um, so i feel like design thinking actually comes into its own a little bit now because the possibilities are limitless um so yeah i would say um doesn't matter what the tool is um you can do it with without any tools as, as amir said you can use sketchpads um, okay, so Amir, Sarah, there is... just one second. David on the chat was just asking what was the name of the collaboration tool again, and it's Mural that we're talking about. That's a tool that we happen to be using. Yeah, for the collaboration. I think there's a number of many others online whiteboards people can draw and pick up post-it notes. Yeah. Sorry, um, I didn't see that. Thanks. In question from um, Alison, which I like. Um, Go for it. So um, Alison is asking, you mentioned empathy building. I wanted to know other specific tools, processes, or questions you use to empathize with people you're solving the challenge for. Um, how do you measure out uh, your level of empathy and how much does this correlate with how good the solution is? Uh, probably my favorite question of the last six months. Um, for me, I mean, I, as I mentioned, the, the kind of the type of user research and, and empathy building that we, we apply, the tools are fairly straightforward. You know, you've got your um, interviews, you know, focus groups, observations, as I showed and so on. So as far as the tooling, I think that I'm kind of always advocate uh, just engaging, stepping out of the office when we could, 
but actually talking to people um, and, and getting to, to hear their stories. When I sit down with analysts and MDs even, I ask them to work with me what, what's a typical day in their life look like. And we just put like smiley faces and sort of frowny faces because I want to get them to admit where all the crying is. is. And we ask about um, uh, how do you know what is um, how do you know that you kind of you reach that level? For me, I mean, empathy is all about feeling what the other person is feeling. And when an MD tells me how she starts the day six in the morning on the train, reading the system outages for from Asia, and finishes the day finishes the day with a glass of red wine at half ten at night when the kids are in bed and she reads the emails from New York, I feel really sad. You know, for me, empathy is when you get that little tear in the corner of your eye. And that's where you realize we need to solve for this. You know, I cannot expect her to use another mobile dashboard at 11 at night. So I think empathy is not difficult, but it is about just step out, talk to people, don't get obsessed with Visio and process flows, capture the, if you like, the mood and kind of the emotional state that your users experience as operations teams, as clients and so on. And that really allows you to, I guess, kind of define the challenge. But more importantly, I think for the team, it really gives you that motivation because once you empathize with someone and you feel sorry for them, it gives you much more of a, of a boost to try and come up with a solution that will try and figure that sort of problem out and solve it. Yeah. So we've actually had quite a lot of questions. Um, there's one or two more that I think we should cover. And if we don't get through everything, we will do our best to respond to everything. We'll work with the SIO to, to provide those responses. An interesting one here, um, and I think it comes up quite a, a lot from an, operation, an operations perspective. I think, and I, Amir, you mentioned it early, early on in your presentation. A lot of people, when they think of design thinking, they think about retail. Um, and not necessarily operations. So there's one here that says, are there any common challenges you've seen when trying to apply design thinking in investment ops projects? Many, many. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I think in retail, it's a very easy discussion because you think, you know, I've got customers, I need to keep them happy. If they're not happy, they're going to move to the competition and I'm going to lose them. Whereas in operations, you've got a captive audience. Right, you got a captive audience, and like I said at the beginning, anything that's sort of human-centered, people kind of think, but we want to get rid of people. You know, we want to reduce our sort of FTE, sort of headcount and whatnot and so on. So getting people to realize that people are still very much part of the solution that you need to come up with, making them realize from a culture perspective, like Roland was saying, that innovation in operations is not just a technology, it's not just about automation. There's a lot of sort of human component to it. So I think in my conversations with clients, some of them definitely understand and it resonates very quickly. Others might be a bit more kind of skeptical because they think, oh, we just need to replace a couple of systems and everyone's going to be happy, which maybe, maybe is valid in that scenario. So I think that that's really kind of the main hurdle is making people realize that uh, human-centered design is relevant to operations. And the second thing is also that creative thinking and creativity, because people, if you think about it, tend to associate creativity with creative industries and the creative arts and you know people with sort of very colorful hair and whatnot but you need to have creativity in operations to solve problems you have to otherwise you're never going to innovate and a question linked that's just come in actually is um and you kind of touched on it just there amir is how do you overcome the suppressed creativity which is something we meet a lot in operations where in the ideation stage you get useful but not necessarily novel ideas Mm -hmm. and a lot of the crazy eight type ideas end up just being very normal. I mean, I think fundamentally it's about creating the right environment and the right kind of setting that people feel that they, they, they can express some of those ideas. And I think like we, we, we show that even maybe having like a little icebreaker, like the worst possible idea, starts to get people thinking along those lines. But more fundamentally, and I touched on that, uh, design thinking is a process that needs to be facilitated. Right? If you look at design thinking literature, it's not just dumping 12 people to self-manage the process and just figure it out. Every design thinking process from start to finish, at the very least, needs to have a facilitator that guides, steers, and in some cases, provide that nudge. Right? So if you do find that people are playing it too safe, and if you're finding that maybe they're not going into other areas, how can you inspire them? I mean, I sometimes bring examples from other industries it's yeah. part of the warm up, right? So we need to be very clear that if you want to run a design thinking process successfully, in my experience, you need to have a strong facilitator that can make sure that people that are not used to working in this way 
or not just, you know, they've done the training, off you go, good luck. That's not going to work. Definitely. I think it's all about what stimulus you bring into the, into the session. Um, providing inspiration from any industry is, is really important and it gets those creative juices flowing, especially, you know, in, in a more operational environment. Um, it can be difficult to find um, examples of, you know, where companies have been innovative and at the forefront. So there's no problem taking in, you know, retail examples or, you know, non-financial services examples to really just show that inspiration and that I find gets, gets um, and exactly, it, exactly. And I think in operations, if you look at kind of the whole uh, kind of supply chain, you know, from even from trade execution to reconciliation, so on, when you get people to think about like, I don't know, DHL and Amazon supply chain and how they work, they start to realize, Hey, you know, there's a lot of things that we can pick up. There's a lot of, uh, tools and ideas we didn't really think about. And look, fundamentally, even a good idea doesn't have to be a crazy novel idea. Maybe it's just an idea that no one thought about before and it's a simple fix. Exactly. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we do want to wrap up. Um, so I'll do one more question and then hand back to Leah. Um, so this is quite a quick one um, or could, could be a quick one. How long does a design thinking project usually take from start to finish? Um, if you look at the process that has five stages and you think about the, the, the type of scope and complexity of problems, I usually go with sort of uh, eight weeks and kind of thinking that each one of those five stages is going to take about a week and a half with about three workshops, right? You can't just, I mean, you need the time to research, you need the time to do those things. So my recommendation is eight weeks is good would usually end up being about 14 to 15 workshops. So one every two, three days, right? But you have to be very clear about the scope and not try and solve the whole kind of universe's problem. I think it's dependent on scope as well. You know, yeah. if it, depending on the size of the organization, depending on, you know, regions or processes or whatever teams that may be in scope will depict the size exactly. of the project. Exactly. And I think the, the, and my, my best recommendation, sorry, just to finish on that note, is that the best way to scope a design thinking project is to think about the number of personas that you're going to be focusing on. So if you know that to solve this process, this problem, we'll have to talk to, you know, this team and that team, and each team represents a persona. And I usually advise people to talk to five people representing each one. In eight weeks, what I found over the last few years, you can probably solve a problem involving three to four max. If you end up with like a list of 12 personas and you've got eight weeks, it's never going to happen. So I would say kind of all sort of uh, looking at the number of personas is a good way of figuring yeah. out the scope. Yeah, absolutely. I think the last thing as well is it depends on the, the understanding of design thinking. Um, within the organization as well. Sometimes we need to spend some time up front um, training and upskilling the organization um, or the team. So um, it really depends on the, <clears throat> the culture in place as well. Okay, um, so we haven't managed to touch on everything. Thank you everyone for your questions. I think it um, brought some interesting conversation and we will do our best to respond um, working with the SIO. So thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you to Amir for taking us through uh, the design thinking concept and bringing it to life. And finally, thank you to the SIO and all of the attendees um, that have joined us today. I will hand over to Leah for the wrap up. Great, thank you, Sarah. All right, so once again, great presentation, great discussions, fantastic Q&A there. I think we've got quite a lot going a lot of interest and um, obviously it would be great for us to hear from everyone here we'll be following up with feedback forms we would like to understand if there's anything different we can do or even any other subjects that you might be interested in us covering we will continue to be in touch with Sarah Callahan and Sarah and Hannah Cameron um, at CAPCO for any other subjects that anyone might be interested in, also any subjects that they might be prepared to, to share with the SIO as well in the near future. Um, so once again, um, thank you, Amir. Uh, it was yeah. an excellent presentation there. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Roland, and um, we'll keep in touch. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye.